let's get this thing started. All right, my name is Wes Seiler, and I am from the Birkin Conservative, and I am so thrilled to be doing our weekly podcast. Uh, this is so much fun. I get a chance to talk to you directly, so if you're watching live, hit me up with a comment. Let me know who you are. Let me know that you're watching live, and we're going to have an awesome dialogue, and then if you're watching this Thursday, Friday, or later, just hit us up with some comments, messages, things like that, and we'll still get to them a few days out. But, you know, I'm so excited to get a chance to do this because there's some topics that I get to address with you. Um, and the big one that we're going to talk about tonight is how we can heal. And uh, you can see I kind of came up with this graphic here, and it's got the Capitol building split with the red and the blue. And I, I feel like it's kind of obvious, the fact that we need the chance to heal. Uh, but I want to talk for a second about why I believe that's necessary is when you think about healing, it really comes from a disease. It comes from some type of ailment or something that you're wrestling with. And uh, I think everybody can understand that and appreciate that right now is that we're going through this time in American history where so many people are frustrated with each other. People are upset at what's going on. So much of it seems to have to do with politics, and that's what we're going to focus on. And so when we look at the future of where is this country going, where are we going as its people, um, I believe that there is some steps that we can take. Uh, there are some things that we can do, some, some things that we can recognize that will help us as we go forward. And so I just wanted to, to offer them to you. It's not this type of thing where I think I have all the answers, but it's certainly something that I've been reflecting on as I've been going forward. And so I wanted to share those with you. So I'm excited to, to see what your thoughts are um, as we go through this. And I wanted to make it as simple as possible. So I kind of boiled it down uh, to three truths that I feel like that we need to affirm and then three actions every single person can take. And this uh, includes me is, uh, you know, I feel like these are truths that I need to wrestle with and that I need to remind myself of. And at the same time, actions that, that I try to take and then I can remind myself to be purposeful in taking these actions. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on that and to see what you think as we go through these. So, you know, the first of these truths that I think that we all need to affirm um, is that not all Trump supporters are racist. Uh, you guys who have been following the show for a while know that I've had uh, people on my show of a, a variety of viewpoints. I've had people who are Republicans and they vote for Trump. I've had people who are Republicans. They didn't vote for Trump. People who are not Republicans at all. Um, I've had hardcore supporters of Trump um, on my show. And I definitely have a following here of people from across the spectrum. And I appreciate that. And having talked to people who adamantly support Trump through thick and thin um, has given me the chance to kind of understand that perspective to find points where I agree with with them. And the conclusion it, that I've come to is that not all Trump supporters are racist. And it frustrates me when I hear that perspective, especially on liberal and moderate networks, is there's almost this assumption that if you if you vote Republican, then you must be a racist or, or that if you support Trump, then you support everything he says. And I've seen so many times where when people say, well, this is why I support Trump, it has nothing to do with race. And I think one of the things, especially for the left and the moderates in this country, is so many of them are passionate about affirmative action. They're passionate about rec uh, racial reconciliation. They're passionate about race in general. And there are so many people that studies have shown where uh, they just don't think about race. There's a huge component of this country where it's just not on their radar is that they just don't think about it. You know, it's, it's sure it's part of them, but they don't identify with it. They, or at least they, it's not something they spend a lot of time focusing on and it just doesn't come to the surface. And so many times I feel like liberals are quick to say, well, if you don't support equality as much as I do, then you must be racist. And lest we forget the, de the definition of racism is someone who believes that one race is superior to another. And I've seen so few people actually state that uh, seem to believe that or act upon that. There certainly are a few people in this country who do that, people that are KKK or neo-Nazis or extremists of some sort, but that's such a small component. And so many times I've seen liberal networks and I've seen uh, liberals themselves act like anyone who doesn't support them must be a racist. 
And so it it's this glossing over the entire Trump movement as if they're defined by the same value set that someone else feels. So I feel like this is a truth that many Democrats, if they're honest, that they'll say, you know what, that's probably not true, that not all Trump supporters are racist, and it allows there to be a discussion about it uh, as opposed to silence in the conversation. The second truth on here is that not all Democrats are communist, and I feel like this is really difficult to talk about these days because it is the same way that liberals will shut down a conversation by, by saying racism, racism, racism. Conservatives do the exact same thing right back to them as they'll say communist, communist, communist. And communism, the actual belief, what Karl Marx talked about, what Lenin advocated, is this belief style where the government controls every component of production, whether it's infrastructure, businesses, even the people. Actual outright communism is this belief that so few countries have even tried and no one's really been able to implement because it's so far-fetched. And um, there are people in this country that are avowed socialist, people like AOC and Bernie Sanders, who tend to rise to the top. They still media attention. People follow them. But to think that that's all Democrats is so much of an oversimplification. We have uh, a guy on our show regularly named Chris, and I love talking to him because he adds some of that nuance that said, you know, it doesn't really uh, attract me, you know, Bernie Sanders and that type of thing, but he does support people like Joe Biden. Right. And there's this distinction between what Joe Biden wants to do versus what Bernie Sanders wants to do. And so many times conservatives are quick to lambast every single every single Democrat as a communist. Most Democrats that I've talked to actually prefer a welfare state. Right. Something where the government is very large and it's providing entitlements and things like that to people. And that's not something that, that I necessarily support. But at the same time, so many programs within Republican administrations have been just that, have been entitlement spending and things like that. And so there's this discussion in the middle that I feel like needs to occur. And it can only occur if we recognize that, look, there are some Democrats who are about socialists, but then there's others who aren't. And now we can have a discussion and to be able to say, OK, explain to me exactly what attracts you to the Democratic Party. Is it? Karl Marx? Is it Lenin? Is it Stalin? Is it Mao Zedong? Or is it something different that actually attracts you to this? And what is that? Right? So it creates that space. And then the third truth that I feel like we need to affirm is the notion that not all politicians are corrupt. And I feel like more and more in this country, we're getting to a place where no one believes that statesmanship, actual civil service, public life, any of those things are actually an option or have any virtue or value at all. And um, there's some reasons why I, I believe we've come to this conclusion is we think that anyone who's in politics uh, immediately forgets the will of the people and they stopped acting on it and they just go after special interest. And if they would just do what we tell them to do as the people, then everything would be fine or at least be better. But, you know, for someone... In that, in that place, I would encourage you to actually consider what it's like for someone to run for office, for someone to be a politician. If you were to get people together, let's say you got a, a group of 100 people together in your area and you were to ask them questions like, what's the best restaurant? What is the best football team? Um, what should we work on in terms of our city today? Even those type of questions, you're immediately going to get people arguing and having differences of opinion. And then if you take it further and you think, okay, now we're going to have a discussion, not about those type of things, but about bump stocks, or we're going to have a question about welfare spending, or we're going to have a question about abortion. You're going to have constant different opinions and disagreements. Anytime that you are someone who's a civil servant over more than just one person, you're going to have differences of opinion. And politicians so many times are trying to balance those things. And then what happens is a clear voice, like a special interest or a business, comes in with a lot of money and then gives them the ability to run for re-election or run for office or a higher office, that type of thing. And the people who gravitate towards that are the ones that actually rise to the top. And so there's so many times where the disagreements, the contradictory nature within the people is not expressed in a clear fashion. And when that occurs, it opens this door 
for someone else to come in to be able to spend their money to be able to try to get what they want done. And so the problem definitely is with this system. The problem is definitely with all of the money that flows into it. But there's also a problem with us as the people because what we want is so different and it changes day to day. It changes year to year. If you look at this country, popular, uh, popular opinion shifts all the time. Uh, our opinions shift. Things on gay marriage, things uh, like uh, abortion, right, have changed in the past five, ten years. And so we expect politicians to follow our will, but it evolves and it grows over time and changes. And sometimes it's contradictory. And then we're surprised when we see a politician flip-flopping. And so, you know, th this notion of all politicians being corrupt, there certainly are some. There certainly are allegations and things like that where a politician has completely been divorced from any semblance of popular will. But then there's also cases where it maybe it's us, maybe it's a change here. And so lambasting all of them as corrupt is something that's just too simple to be true. And, um, you know, I had some, I've talked about him on the show many times, but um, I got a chance when I was um, in college to work for a politician who wasn't corrupt. His name was Sam Johnson out of Texas. And this was a guy who served over 20 years in the Air Force. He um, had then uh, retired and been an instructor, and then he decided he wanted to continue serving his country, and he ran for office and uh, represented it well, and I got a chance to work with him, and you see the pictures there, and this was a guy who was just extremely humble, despite all the medals that he had won, all the recognition, everything he had done. He had spent seven years in Vietnam as a prisoner of war, keeping the faith there, and had come home and was just an amazing man. But he's also someone who didn't really float to the top of the media stream. He's not someone that you would see on Fox News all the time. He's not someone that would always grab headlines because he was a down-to-earth guy trying to do his job and advocate on, off of, uh, on behalf of his people. That's not necessarily something that's going to get you a lot of media attention as opposed to the AOCs out there, the Ted Cruz's who are constantly grabbing headlines with the latest remark or things like that and chasing that around. He was in his office working on the Ways and Means Committee trying to make this country better. Um, and so when people say all politicians are corrupt, we look at people like Sam and that can't be the case. But what is it about Sam that makes him so good versus the people that we pay attention to? And how can we focus more on getting these people right to represent us as opposed to people who are just chasing the soundbite? That's what we're going to get into. But I look at this and Ultimately, these three truths come to a conclusion, uh, and it's something that I feel like is never talked about, whether it's you know Newsmax or Fox or MSNBC or CNN or any of it. It's that government, to the extent that it is corrupt, it's because human nature itself is corrupt. And we're so quick to say, you know, the problem is never me. It's the liberals. It's the moderates. It's the rhinos. It's the system, it's the politicians, and if only we would do X, Y, and Z, then everything would be fine or it'd be a whole lot better. And that just ignores the fact that there's problems with every single person. There's problems with every single politician. There's problems with me, with ourselves. And the fallen state of our human nature, the, the contradictory nature that that we bring to the table every time and that every one of our neighbors brings makes this so much more complicated than any one party or politician or issue, right? Is there is uh, an understanding in our system of government that we're never going to get to the full truth, that we're never going to have the ideal system because it was never built that way. It was never to that point uh, that we thought, Hey, if we just had a very active, strong government, that we'd be able to do everything that we need to do. Our system is one where there are checks and balances and opposing forces and all these things that make government slow to the point that people really have to agree on something before it gets anywhere. And that agreement is going to be tough to find. And that causes us to take a moment and think about what we're doing before we get there. And so when people say, hey, government is ineffective, yeah, it's by its very nature. And it's also because of us. And so as we go forward, we see some nuance being built whenever we realize that there are Trump supporters who are very good people. They're not all racist. 
And then at the same time, there are Democrats who are good people. They're not all communists. Then there are politicians who are good people. And maybe those are the people whose names you don't know. Maybe that's because they're so busy working hard. And maybe even if we had the best politicians ever, we'd still have problems in the system itself. And so this type of nuance, what do we do with that? What do we do with it? How do we act going forward? So how do we, if we get an understanding of, I'm not going to listen to the extremist voices that try to simplify everything. What do I do instead? Do I just sit there and say, oh, you know, I, I'm going to listen to Wes's show and that's it. No, I want to give you actual steps that you can take and that I can take based on these things that we've talked about. So uh, the first of them, three different actions. The first action is find someone who is different than you and discuss an issue that you care deeply about. So if you are very passionate about immigration and you believe that we need stronger immigration laws to be able to kick out more illegal people and to stop the flood you know, that's going on at the border, then find someone who doesn't even think that there is a flood at the border. Find someone who's embracing illegal immigration. If you feel a certain way about health care or abortion or COVID or whatever the issue is, find someone in your life who thinks differently. I feel like there's so many people that I've talked to over the past several weeks who say, I don't know anybody in my life who believes something different. In my, my Facebook feed or my Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is, is only giving me people that I already agree with. Well, go search out someone who's differently, uh, who believes differently. And if you need help finding that, I can certainly do it because we've got people on our page who believe a variety of different things. But find someone who is different. And then once you've done that, listen to them. Ask why they believe what they do. And it, it, it will probably make you mad. It will probably make you very mad to actively listen to someone who believes something different than you. It certainly does to me. If I'm, you know, as a Christian, and most people know that that's my faith, spending time talking to someone who's an atheist or an agnostic tends to make me upset because I believe so strongly in my faith and it's at the core of my existence of who I am. And now I'm listening to someone tell me that God doesn't exist, uh, that, you know, all Christians are terrible and, um, you know, that they're just awful and they don't want any part of it. That's deeply unsettling and hurtful to me as someone who takes my faith very seriously. However, if I can actively listen and ask them why, one of the things that I can do is I can start to uncover what's behind their belief. Because so many times I'm surprised. So many times I've had conversations with people who are liberals, Democrats, atheists, agnostic, Muslim, you name it. And I expect that what they're going to say is that, you know, I don't believe in God because there's no evidence, right? And that's what I assume they're going to say. And then I talk to them and I come to find out that they had you know, a father who went to church, called himself a Christian who abused them. It has nothing to do with evidence, right? It has everything to do with their perception of Christians. It's very different than my perspective. I've had people who are Democrats and they honestly don't know anything about the Soviet Union or economics or how communism works. They're scared because they have 40 or $50,000 in student loans and they don't know what to do and they feel like they're going to be buried for the rest of their life in this debt. And then someone named Bernie comes along and tells them it's not your fault. It's the fact that the whole system is charging you hundreds and hundreds of dollars for textbooks and has inflated the cost of education and doesn't really care about you. And you've been duped into a lie for a worthless degree and that, that we've got to completely change the system to fix it. And then they start gravitating there. So they're, they don't know anything about the history of 1917 or what Karl Marx wrote or what uh, you know, Fidel Castro was trying to do in Cuba. All they know is they are having to pay five or six or $700 in student loans every month while they're waiting tables. And they don't know how they got here. They've just completely lost track of that. And so they're like, hey, what else am I supposed to do? This sounds really good. And, and so I understand now that they're not coming from a place of, hey, they want to destroy the country or they don't care about it at all. They're coming from a place of concern and fear for their lives. And what are they going to do besides this to be able to pay their bills? That's different than how they are portrayed so many times in the media. Does it make them right? But it gives me a door to be able to talk about that. And so that can surprise you. That can lead you to a completely different understanding 
Again, not something that you have to agree with, but something that you can appreciate that you find. And then third, when they're done making their case, ask them to consider your sources. Look at, tell them not just what your position is, but how you got to it. Show that to them as opposed to your eloquence or your particular brain power, right? So many times I see this, especially in the conservative movement today, where it's all about, hey, listen to me, listen to my show, listen to my perspective, listen to what's going on in my head, um, and then take that and run with it. And what I'm doing here, these are just ideas. You, you see on what I'm doing, it's named after Burke, the Burking conservative, because that's my source. Edmund Burke is where I get most of my material that I talk about on this show. Um, Russell Kirk, George Nash, um, Yuval Levin, so many different authors who have influenced me over the years, and I'm trying to bring them to the table with you, and I'm happy to discuss that. Do the same thing with someone is, hey, you know, the reason that uh, I believe differently about socialism or economics is because I lived during the Soviet Union and I saw what it did to people. And I want to show that to you. I want to show you the fear that communist governments caused, you know, in me when I was a kid. I want to show you this documentary on abortion and why it horrifies me. I want to tell you about my life and the things that I've seen uh, that have influenced my opinions the way that I have. And when you start to do that, you're moving beyond just, hey, talking down to someone and listen to me because I'm me to take a look at this. And maybe it won't convince them, but it, in the same way, it will give them something to digest and to consider more than just your opinion or what you're stating. So those are three actions that I think are particularly helpful. Um, those are ways that we can heal. And that's just totally different than the way that media and especially social media is designed. Social media today is this, uh, this mechanism where people just very quickly copy and paste uh, sources without actually reading them, without actually uh, taking any time to consider where they're coming from. It's just headlines and pictures that grab your attention without any sort of productive dialogue. And it takes things like what we're doing with our show to be able to get you to a point where you can take a second and think, wait, what's behind all of that? And can I do something differently as opposed to writing a nasty comment? Can I call this person up? In so many ways, Facebook and YouTube and all the things that we're on doesn't naturally lend itself to those type of conversations. But the way that we can heal is by forcing those different systems, creating new ones so in such a way that productive, healthy conversations can occur and then people start to understand, oh, when I thought of conservative, I thought of someone who is mean and hateful or whatever, and then they experience you, and it's something totally different and, frankly, much more attractive, right? So that's what we try to do. We do have a Facebook. We have a YouTube. We have a website. We use these different systems, but we try to gear them towards productive means. So that's what I'm doing here. That's what I'm doing on this show as often as I can. We have our Sunday night shows where we do that. I uh, love to start up podcasts like this one um, and do this as often as I can on Wednesdays to be able to get your comments, to be able to encourage this type of thing. Because as we start to experience that understanding and those positive relationships, we can grow, we can bring more conservatives into the fold. We can really define better what that means and uh, and hopefully get to a better place than, than what you find America in today. So um, if you haven't yet, take a look at our YouTube, take a look um, like us on Facebook, take a look at our website. Most importantly of all, you can see all kinds of interviews here where we've been doing this now for about a year. Um, you can sign up for a newsletter and get more updates for shows like this one. And then, as I said, you can comment, dialogue with me. Let me know what you think of the three truths, the three actions that I threw down. Are those things that would be helpful? Are those things that you practice in your life today? Are the things that you could do more of? And what kind of result do you think that would bring? So would love to hear that. Thank you guys for tuning in live. Uh, the folks that did, looks like we had about six or seven folks that did that. So thank you guys. Um, and then anybody who's watching this afterwards, again, feel free to interact. And look forward to seeing you Sunday when we have our next show. Good night.